So, good morning and welcome to the Getting Started with LLVM tutorial. I'm Florian and together with Jessica, we are going to introduce you to a few different areas of LLVM. And hopefully after this talk, you'll be ready to get started with working on your own transformations and also comfortable enough to take a look at the LLVM code base itself and work on the LLVM code base itself. So let's take a look at what um, we plan to talk about for the next hour. So we'll start off with a little bit of background about LLVM, hopefully enough for you to be able to follow through the, the examples we go through later on. Then we're going to switch gears a little bit and take a look at some actual examples of uh, middle-end transformations in LLVM. And then we switch gears again and Jessica will take over and she will tell you all about uh, getting started with LLVM backend development and all you need to know uh, to contrast uh, middle-end passes and backend passes in LLVM. So to start off with, let's talk about LLVM IR. Um, what is LLVM IR? It's um, really a centerpiece of LLVM's middle-end and it basically is uh, LLVM's intermediate representation it's a generic assembly language, which is the input and output of all the middle-end transformations in LLVM. So all the transformations and analysis passes in LLVM's middle-end work on it. And yeah, we call those passes also IR passes. It's been designed with a few things in mind. So for example, uh, many transformations that we'd like to do in the middle end, work on this intermediate representation relatively straight, in a straightforward way. So common operations like, say, replacing uh, an instruction with a different instruction, those kinds of things are relatively easy to do in the middle end. It's also easy to lower to different targets. So LLVMI itself is quite generic, but it can be lower to a wide range of targets. And if you take a look at the number of backends that LLVM comes with, I think it does quite well on that front. And finally, we also want the improvements we make to the IR to translate to similar improvements in the final binary. And yeah, it does quite well on that front as well. So now let's talk about a few elements of uh, LLVM IR. Um, we can see an example of LLVM IR on the slide, but let's break things down a little bit. First, let's take a look at instructions in LLVM IR. Um, you can see an example on the slide highlighted here. And instructions in LLVM, they have an opcode which identifies the instruction and you use that to look up the semantics and syntax of the instructions and so on. So for example, here we have an add instruction uh, those instructions, they usually take a set of input operands like um, A and 13 in our example here. They produce uh, one or zero result values. So in the example here, add of course produces the uh, sum of its operands, but there are also instructions like a call of avoid function that doesn't produce any result values. And you probably already noticed everything, like, like most constructs in LLVM IR, uh, instructions are explicitly typed, so you have to provide the types of the arguments, the types of the functions you're calling, and so on. And this is, you'll see that all through the other IR elements as well. Now, as you can imagine, there's a large number of instructions in LLVM IR, but don't worry, we don't go over all of them. Um, but let's highlight some, some important classes of instructions. Of course, there are a bunch of arithmetic instructions, so add, sub, multiply, both for integer and floating point, for example. There are various compare and conditional instructions, uh, like integer floating point compares with various predicates. There are various control flow instructions, like conditional branches, regular branches, um, returns, and so on. Uh, call instructions, so you can do direct and indirect function calls. Um, and the load and store instructions. Great. So let's go one level up, and this is where basic blocks come in. So basic blocks in LLVM IR, they have a label to ref that we can use to refer to those basic blocks in the IR itself. They can also not have a label, then they will be implicitly numbered, and we can use this number. And then they consist of a list of instructions, 
So on the slide, you can see a few examples of basic blocks and the instructions in a basic block, they're executed sequentially. And the last instruction in a basic block, we refer to it as terminator and each basic block needs to have a terminator and there are no fall throughs to the, to the next basic block um, if there's no terminator. So now that we have basic blocks, we go another level up and this is where functions come in. They have a name and a type signature. So on the slide, we have a, a function called foo, which takes two integer arguments and returns an integer. Uh, and then it's basically a list of basic blocks. Uh, the first basic block in the function is special. Uh, we call it the entry block. And when you call a function, then this is where the execution starts. But the order of the other basic blocks in the function is completely irrelevant because the control flow between the basic blocks in the function is modeled exclusively by the block's terminators. So in the example on the slide, we have the entry block, which is implicitly reachable. And then we have uh, a branch to either the BB1 or BB2, and we have two edges to them in the control flow. Finally, the next level up is uh, modules. Modules in LLVMIR is kind of the top level container of a program, and it can contain a bunch of stuff like functions. So you can have multiple functions, um, you can have declarations, uh, global variables, um, and a lot more. So after this um, very quick overview, I'm sure there are a lot of IR related questions that you might have, like what are the instructions that are available? What's the semantics of those instructions? How do I define uh, custom types and so on? And that's perfectly fine because there is a um, great resource that you can use to find answers to all your IR related questions. And that's the LLVM language reference, which you can view online and also in the LLVM repository itself. And that's really the document that defines LLVM IR. So all the constructs should be um, clearly explained there. And if not, then it's probably a bug that uh, needs clarification. So next, I'd like to briefly clarify some common terminology we use related to instructions, uses, and uses. Um, and for that, let's take a look. Uh, let's focus on the two instructions on the slide where we have uh, an add instruction and a compare instruction. Um, so first, um, so we use um, labels to refer to the result value of an instruction, but it's important to note that those are not variables. So we cannot assign to them and those labels, they have to be unique. They are kind of a unique reference to the result value. So yeah, we have, we, for example, we use sum to refer to the result of the add instruction and cont for the compare instruction. So now let's take a look at what goes on when an instruction uses an in, another instruction as an operand. So in the example here, we have the add instruction, which is then used by the uh, compare instruction so in this relationship, we call uh, sum the definition and we call, um, uh, and then we say that um, the conditional instruction uses sum as an operand and we call the whole instruction that has a use the user and you can access the list of users for any given definition so on the example on the slide, you see all the uses of sum in the program, uh, in the function. And this is really useful for a bunch of things. So for example, if you want to replace um, sum with a different instruction, you'd have to update all the uses. Um, or if you want to do some data flow analysis, you can use those def use chains to propagate your information along those edges. Um, another important thing is that um, all uses in LLVMIR must be uh, reachable from the definition. So if we flip our cond and sum instruction um, as on the slide, then we'll have a problem. Uh, and if we try to uh, run LLVM on that, um, we get an error telling us that 
we try to use uh, some before it's been defined, and that's uh, invalid. We are not allowed to do that. So to wrap up the IR section, let me briefly talk about the three different uh, formats of LLVM IR. First, we have the textual IR, which you've already seen. It's obviously human readable, and this is what really what we use for LLVM past development and debugging. So you would write um, a LLVM IR program in textual form and then run your passes on it and then check the output if it did the desired transformation. But as you can imagine, for large-scale programs, this is not really useful. Um, and this is where LLVM bitcode comes into play. It's an efficient storage format for the IR, and it's also backwards compatible. So I think at the moment, LLVM 9 can still read LLVM bitcode files generated um, by LLVM 3.9. So this is really useful if you want to file a bug report, for example, and you want to make sure that the reproducer of the bug is still readable by LLVM in like three or four years' time. And finally, there's also the in-memory representation where all those different uh, elements we talked about previously are mapped to classes, and then your program is basically represented as a set of objects. And this is really what we use um, to interact with the IR in C and C++ when we do our transformations. All right, so after this quick overview, let's take a look at some actual transformation examples. In our tutorial, we'll just focus on modifying the control flow of a function, and we also won't go in any details about the scaffolding around required to set up a pass to actually run our transformation. This can be found in the code examples we provide. Um, and uh, if you're interested in hearing more about the machinery involved with setting up passes and all that stuff, there's been a great tutorial already at LLVM Dev writing an LLVM Pass 101. So if you're interested in that, check out the recording for that talk. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so for our transformation examples, um, I'd like to look at uh, removing dead blocks as a simple example. And to motivate the case, take a look at the example on the slide where we have um, a single function which has uh, three basic blocks, and they all return a value. So what's going on here? Um, if you take a look at the control flow of the function, we have the entry block, which is implicitly reachable because it's the special entry block. But then there are no branches to either um, BB1 or BB2 because we don't have any branches to them. So we know that they can never be executed. Um, so we don't really need them in our program. So we can remove them, or we want to remove them to reduce the size of our function and also um, avoid having to run further analysis or unnecessary transformations on them. So for the example we're looking, or for the example transformation we're looking to implement, we for the sake of simplicity, we want to use a very simple condition to, de to detect those uh, trivially dead blocks. And this is just by looking at the predecessors. So if a block doesn't have any predecessors, then we know it can never be executed. So how would we go about implementing a transformation like this? For that, we'll just uh, focus on writing a function that takes an LLVM IR function and applies a transformation directly to the IR function we get as an input. So what we're going to do is we're going to iterate over all the basic blocks in our function, and then we try to find all those trivially dead blocks. So the first thing we're going to check is we want to filter out blocks with predecessors because we know they won't be trivially dead. And for that, all we have to do is um, to take a look at the list of, or at the predecessors of our basic block, and if there are any predecessors, we just skip this basic block in our analysis. So this kind of code pattern is quite common in LLVM. You'll see it 
if you take a look at the LLVM code base, you see it all over the place. Um, and it really helps to reduce so this kind of code pattern where you check for a condition and then you have an early exit or a continue or a break in your, in your functions because it helps to reduce the level of nesting. Okay, so now I'd like to take a quick uh, detour and think about how we actually can get the predecessors of a, of a block in LLVM IR. If you think back to the IR examples early on, um, it's quite easy to get the successors of a basic block because we just need to look at the, the terminators of a basic block, right? But um, there is nothing explicitly expressing this um, predecessor relationship in LLVMIR. But there is still a way to, to get the predecessors, of course. And for that, we can use the fact that basic blocks in LLVMIR are also values with users so we can make use of that information when it comes to uh, getting the predecessors. So for example, on the slide, we have the entry block, which has a conditional branch, and the conditional branch uses um, BB1 and BB2. So by looking at the uses of those basic blocks, we can get the predecessors. So all we have to do is we have to um, iterate over all the uses of our basic block if we want to get the predecessors, and then check if they're terminator instructions, um, and if they're terminators, then we know that the basic block the terminators are in um, are the predecessors of our basic block. Okay, now let's get back to, to our actual transformation. So the next thing we have to do is we also have to account for the entry block, because it won't have any incoming edges in the control flow, but it's implicitly reachable because it's the entry block, so we cannot delete it. So now we've checked for our conditions for those trivially dead blocks. So let's delete the block. And finally, um, we also want to indicate to our caller whether we change the underlying IR or not because this allows the calling function to decide whether they want to do further transformations or they want to run some analysis again. So those kinds of, for those kinds of things, it's really useful to indicate whether we, we made some changes to the IR. Okay, so are we done? No, unfortunately, there are still a few problems left that we have to um, solve and that we have to account for um, when we make changes to the IR. So if we try to run our transformation as it is now on our motivating example from earlier, we can use um, the opt binary for that. And if we set up a pass that actually runs our transformation um, on this example, we'll get a crash that looks something like this. So we unfortunately hit the segmentation fault, which is not uh, great, obviously. Um, so let's take a look at what's going on here. So we use a race from parent to remove our basic block, um, but the name already hints at that it will remove this basic block from its parent container, which is the containing function. But this is also the thing that we are iterating over. So we invalidate our iterator by removing uh, a basic block, and this causes the segmentation fault. So we have to um, avoid that. And as you can imagine, this is quite a common pattern in LLVM. So you iterate over a bunch of stuff and you want to remove uh, some elements. And there, is a, there are lots of utilities to deal with those kinds of things. And one, the thing we're going to use here is this make early ink range utility, which turns our um, which turns our iterator into one that will increment early so we can um, remove elements while, we, while we're iterating. Um, with that, if we run our transformation on the motivating example now, everything's fine in this case because there are still a few other things we have to think about when we go about uh, changing DIR. The, 
So another thing we have to think about and we have to account for is what's going to happen to the uses outside of the basic block of instructions that we remove. So in the example on the slide here, we have uh, BB1, which we will remove. And it contains an instruction that is then used in BB2. So if we just go and try to remove BB1 and the containing instructions, um, we'll run into another problem, which will look something like this, where um, LLVM tells us that we try to remove um, this uh, instruction RAS while it's still being used. And as if you remember back to the earlier slides, this is also something we, we are not allowed to do. So we have to take care of the, of the uses that, of the instructions that we're going to remove. Now, because we know the basic block those instructions are in can never be executed. We know that those instructions never can contribute to the actual result of the function, right? So what we can do is we can replace those instructions, or sorry, the uses of those instructions with arbitrary values. And to do that, we basically can just iterate over the, um, the instructions in the basic block and then replace them with an arbitrary value. And we can use LLVM's under value for that. And after we, we replaced all the users, we can just remove the instruction and we know that the problem we had before cannot um, occur anymore. So if we run it on the example now with our fix, uh, things are looking good. And finally, um, when we remove a basic block, we also remove the terminator of the basic block, which means that the, some basic blocks might lose successors, uh, lose predecessors. So we remove edges in the control flow. But some instructions in basic blocks, they rely on having a certain number of predecessors, like the uh, phi instruction on the slide. So phi nodes in LLVM, they basically have one entry for each predecessor. But then if we remove BB2, we'll have another problem, which will look something like this, where LLVM is telling us that um, we now have a phi node which doesn't have one entry for each predecessor. And this is also not allowed. So the thing we have to do is we also have to inform our successor, the successors of the block we remove, that they lost the predecessor. And once we've done that, um, we should have covered um, most cases or all cases um, for our simple transformation and things are fine. Just this hopefully gives you an idea of the things you have to think about when you modify DIR because it looks simple, but then there are a few things you have, to, you have to watch out for. So for the next example, of an IR transformation, let's take a look at simplifying conditional branches. So if we take a look at the control flow of the function on the slide, it's quite simple. We have a conditional branch in the entry block to either the then or else block. But if we take a closer look at the condition of this uh, conditional branch, we know that we'll always branch to the then block, right? So what we really want to do is we want to remove the conditional branch and replace it with an unconditional branch to the then block because this simplifies our control flow. And in this example, it will also um, surface another dead block else, which can then be removed by earlier transformation. You might be wondering why would you write code like that in the first place? I mean, if you write a program, you would never use a conditional branch when you already know um, where you're branching to. So this has to do with the way transformations in LLVM are structured in general, where you have uh, a bunch of isolated transformations that work together. So for example, in LLVM, there's constant propagation, which just takes care of um, propagating constants and constant folding. And after this pass is run, you might end up with conditions, uh, with constant conditions at branches. But in order to keep constant propagation simple, we don't want constant propagation itself to do the 
modification of the control flow because that's, it can rely on other passes like the transformations we implement here to, to do the cleanup. And then this is also applicable to many more cases. So we don't want to do the same thing in a bunch of different passes because it's just unnecessary. So let's take a look at how we go about implementing it. Similar to um, our earlier example, we take a look at all the basic blocks in our function um, and check for, for a few conditions. So we want to first filter out uh, basic blocks without any conditional branches. So all we, oops, all we have to do is um, take a look at the terminator instructions of our basic block and make sure that we have a conditional branch. Um, and if we don't have a conditional branch, we just skip it. Next, we also want to filter out branches without any constant conditions because we cannot do, uh, replace them with unconditional branches. So we just take a look at the condition of the branch. If it's a constant integer, um, uh, if it's not a constant integer, then we just uh, skip this block. Um, yeah. The next thing we have to do, similar to the earlier transformation, we are going to remove um, an edge in the control flow. So we have to tell the block we are not branching to anymore that it lost the predecessor. So we do that, similar to the early example. Um, and finally, we want to replace the conditional branch with an unconditional one. And the way to do that is we basically create a new unconditional branch to the target we are branching to before our conditional branch. And then all we have to do is we have to um, remove the conditional branch. So this concludes the LMVMIR specific section. And now I'd like to hand over to Jessica to tell you all about the uh, backend side of things. Thanks, Lorian. Okay, so now that we know how to build some middle-end transformations, let's talk about how we can incorporate some target-specific information into our transformations. It, the general theme here is that middle-end passes simplify programs and they use heuristics to improve them. And these changes are generally good decisions across many targets. Uh, some examples of these include, say, removing branches, eliminating dead code constructs, uh, inlining functions, for example. And so the overall theme is that middle-end transformations are going to try and reduce the number of IR instructions in a program and simplify control flow. This puts the IR in a sort of canonical form, which should be able to produce a good program for many targets. However, this doesn't take into account the target itself. And targets have very different qualities that can impact the overall result of a transformation. Some examples of target-specific qualities include things like instruction latency, the available instruction set, and the registers available on the target. All of these things are unique to a specific target and this, those things aren't really modeled in IR in any meaningful way. The goal of IR, remember, is to allow you to optimize code for many targets in a generic way, and so it's not really appropriate to have that information there. As an example of how this can show up, let's think about how IR constructs are ultimately represented on various targets. So let's take a look at the UI to FP instruction there. It works on a vector of I16s. The target instructions necessary to represent this IR instruction can vary significantly across targets or even subtargets. For example, on an ARCH64 target with full 16-bit floating point support, this is it only takes one instruction to represent. But on another ARH64 that doesn't have full 16-bit floating point support, this takes many instructions to represent. And this information 
isn't really modeled in the IR in any way. We don't really want to include this information in the IR because our overall goal, goal is to keep things generic. So baking in uh, assumptions about the target are gonna work against this goal. A good idea is to allow your transformation to query something that will give you information about the target. That way, the transformation can know if an instruction is costly in one way or another. And from there, it can tune its behavior to avoid making poor decisions. One of the ways we can do this is using the target transform info class. Target transform info lives in lib analysis, and targets can provide their own target transform info, which overrides functions provided in the base target transform info. What this does is it allows you to write these hooks, and these hooks can be overridden by targets. These hooks typically provide target-specific heuristics for some pass or many passes. For example, you could write a hook which would tell you roughly how many instructions this UI to FP might take, or you could write a hook that tells you how big a cache line is on the target. Uh, for example, we could have a hook that estimates how expensive it is to compute an address. The nice thing about this is that target transform info's hooks can have some default behavior which tends to work well across many targets, but if a target would do better with a different heuristic, it can provide its own. And this allows passes to tune their behavior based off whatever heuristic is provided by the target, if any. This makes it possible to do things like create target-aware cost models for generic passes. These hooks are pretty good at modeling things that require, at most, information about the target itself. What I mean here is things like hooks that return the size of specific types of registers, or hooks that make decisions based off what the target itself is or what features it has. What's important to notice about these is these are independent of the program itself. If we want to model target-specific information about the program, then we end up having to use heuristics. And so because of this, we usually have to talk about things in terms of abstract costs of things like types or instructions or overheads of types, instructions, and so on. This is because we don't know which target instructions will ultimately end up in the program until instruction selection. For many passes that use this, this is entirely fine, and it tends to do a pretty good job of producing a good result. So the question you might have now is, okay, well, when do you actually need more than target transform info? As an example of this, let's consider this ARH64 specific optimization. I don't expect you to understand this assembly if you don't work on ARH64, but just trust me when I say that when you see two stores like this, you can merge them into a single store instruction. The question is, can you perform this optimization using only IR? Well, no, you can't. Uh, paired stores are a target-specific feature, and so they're not gonna be modeled in the IR, and so we can't reliably produce one. And until instruction selection, we don't even know if these stores are going to appear in the program. They could be introduced as a result of lowering some other IR instruction, for example. But this is a valuable transformation, and so we'd like our compiler to be able to do it. The way we're gonna do this is using cogen passes. We also call these backend passes fairly interchangeably. Because cogen passes know about target instructions, they happen after instruction selection, and because they happen after instruction selection, they don't work on IR. We use a different representation in the backend than in the middle end. That representation is called machine IR, or MIR for short. MIR looks like this. The goal of MIR is to lower the, tar uh, the IR into target assembly instructions, and it is very target specific and very close to the target's assembly. The anatomy of a MIR instruction goes something like this. MIR features specific, or target specific opcodes, which are 
declared for the target itself. Uh, this, for example, is an x86 mirror instruction, and so this opcode is x86 specific. Mirror has virtual registers prior to register allocation. Virtual registers are denoted by a percent sign followed by a number. These are placeholders for some kind of register. Mirror also has physical registers. These represent the real registers that are available on the target system. After register allocation, every virtual register is going to be replaced with a physical register. Some mirror instructions, such as this one, uh, may have some physical registers before register allocation. And this is often because this instruction is defined to work on or modify that specific register all of the time. There are a couple other things that you can see on this mirror instruction that I'm not really going to cover here for the sake of time. However, you can check out the mirror language reference to learn more. There's also a past tutorial which covers this topic in greater detail. Another thing I'd like to point out about mirror is each operand in a mirror instruction can be accessed by its index. In mirror, operands can mean what you expect, which is usually inputs, but they can also be the results of the instruction. Like in this case, operand zero is actually the result of the add. So this is something to keep in mind when you're working on mirror. All right, so there's some pretty big differences between IR and MIR. In particular, with IR, our representation is fixed. No pass is going to change the way that we represent a subtract instruction, for example. This makes it really easy to move IR passes around and experiment with them. In CodeGen, this isn't true. After instruction selection, our subtract instruction might look something like this, but other passes, like say liveness analysis, might add metadata to the representation itself. And cogen passes are required to make sure that these analyses remain valid once they've been computed. And this is usually done by the pass itself. Later passes, such as register allocation, can lower the mirror into a form that's closer to the target assembly as well. And register allocation is kind of interesting because now we only have finitely many physical registers that we're working with. And because of this, we no longer have this nice SSA form that we have in IR all of the time. And so transformations that rely on this or are made easier by SSA form are not going to be possible or they're going to be very difficult to do post-register allocation. The main takeaway here is that you have to be careful of where in the past pipeline you put CodeGen passes. You should really think about which information you need for your transformation. Uh, in general, earlier is usually easier because you can take advantage of things like SSA and you don't need to worry about fixing up things as much. Aside from differences in IR and MIR, working in CodeGen itself isn't too different from working in the middle end. CodeGen is designed to be similar to the middle end, and so the constructs that you're going to use aren't going to be too different. Uh, in the middle end, we have functions, basic blocks, and instructions. Functions contain basic blocks, which in turn contain instructions. In CodeGen, it's laid out the same way but with its own structures. We have machine functions, which contain machine basic blocks, which contain machine answers. Uh, because CodeGen and the middle end have such similar structures, the interfaces in CodeGen and the middle end are pretty similar. There aren't too many surprises here, and if you're comfortable with using the middle end structures, you don't have a lot to worry about in CodeGen. For example, a loop over each instruction in a basic block where you dump the instruction is going to look pretty much identical in CodeGen as in the middle end. Of course, there are some differences, though. Like, for example, in the middle end, if you want to check if an instruction is a conditional branch, you're going to use something like a dynamic cast and then check the result. While in CodeGen, if we wanted to do the same thing, we'd use a member function that lives in machine instr. Uh, something that's really helpful here is the LLVM docsygen docs. Uh, 
If you look there, you can find documentation for all of the cogen types and middle end types as well. Now I think we're ready to get into a simple example of how we work in CodeGen. What we're gonna do is we're going to implement a very simple peephole optimization. The peephole I'd like to give an example of is some ARH64 specific branch optimization. Um, and in ARH64, I wanna make the claim that it is possible to fold these two instructions together. The first instruction is called a conditional select increment, or CSync for short. The result of the CSync is stored in its first input, and it has two source registers, in this case, both WZR and a condition. So when the condition is true, it's gonna set W9, in this case, to the value in its first input. WZR is an ARH640 register, so when this is true, it's gonna set W9 to zero. When the condition is false, it's gonna set W9 to the value in its second input plus one. The second input is also the zero register, so when the condition is false, W9 is always gonna be one. The next instruction is called a test branch non-zero. The first input is a register containing a value to check, and the second is a bit number to check. The third is an address to branch to. If, in this case, W9's 0th bit is not zero, we're gonna branch to the given address. Now, if you stare at this for a bit, you might notice that this is the same thing as just checking if the condition given to the CSync is false, and then just branching. So a simple peephole optimization you might wanna do here is replace this pattern when you see it with a branch that checks if that condition's false. This would save an instruction and maybe produce some faster code. So how are we gonna do this? We're gonna use this handy thing called target instr info. Target instr info describes the instructions that are used by the target. Uh, things included in target instr info include things like instruction mnemonics, the number of operands on an instruction, and whether or not an instruction is commutable. Like target transform info, this class is implemented for every target, and different targets can opt into hooks that are included in the base target instr info. Uh, this allows for code patterns like this. We have a target hook, optimized cont branch, and it's implemented differently by different targets. The default behavior here is gonna be return false, but if a target opts into it, it can use it to replace a machine instr or several, several machine instrs representing a conditional branch with an optimized pattern. If it does this, it's gonna return true. And then this can be used by a pass to peephole optimized instructions. By using a hook, we can keep the base pass generic, but have targets provide the real optimization and analysis functionality. So if we packed all of this up into a nice little pass, it might just look something like this. The overall loop here is very, very similar to the IR pass examples earlier, but notice that all of the work is actually being done by the hook. So how do we implement this hook? So to implement this hook, we need to work with mirror. Remember that mirror is very, very similar to target assembly. As a result, each assembly instruction in our example is going to correspond to a mirror instruction. Some assembly opcodes are going to correspond to many mirror opcodes. This is usually due to one opcode having multiple options for the types of inputs that it can handle, like say, different sizes of registers, like in this example. So what we're gonna have to do is consider each of these when handling a single instruction. So let's just start writing some code. For the sake of this tutorial, I'm gonna show you how to write a simplified version of the existing optimized con branch function that lives in ARH64 instr info. My goal here is to have you not feel confused when you go and look at that code, but rather feel like you can understand what's going on and experiment with confidence. So what's the first thing you should do when you have some function with arbitrary input you should check that it's what do you expect. <laughs> so there's a lot of different ways to do this, but in code gen, we tend to do this with a lot of asserts. So let's think about what we wanna match here. We wanna find either the test branch or the csync first. 
In assembly, it doesn't look like it's particularly harder or easier regardless of how you pick one, but in mirror, we can have SSA form. So because we have SSA form, this makes it very easy to walk bottom up. This is because the register that's used in our test branch is defined by the CSYNC uniquely. So like an IR, we can walk these def use chains. So let's look at the test branch first. We're gonna write a small function that checks if our machine instr MI is the type of instruction that we want. Before we do that, let's think about, all right, what are we looking for here? For this optimization, we want to match TBNZ instructions. And so we need to check if it has one of the available TBNZ mirror op codes. Second off, we only want to test bit zero because that's the only bit that should be set by that CSYNC instruction in the overall pattern that we're looking for. So what's this gonna look like? Well, first, we have to check that the instruction's opcode is one of the ones that we expect. If we fail this, we're just gonna return false. Next, we have to check that the immediate operand on the TBNZ is what we expect as well. To check the immediate, we're gonna use get im. We can safely do this here without any checks because we know that the first operand of every well-formed TBNZ instruction must be an immediate. If we get an immediate other than zero, we're gonna return false. So at the end of this function, we know whether or not MI is something that we want to handle in our optimization. All right, great, we got the TBNZ. Next up, let's find the CSYNC. So we have these def use chains like before, but something that can happen in Mirror is you can end up with these copy instructions. Copy instructions can get in the way when you're walking definitions. But the thing about these copies is that any CSYNC that we wanna optimize here is defining only the zeroth bit. So it doesn't matter if we copy this around even between differently sized registers because the value is going to be exactly the same at the end of the copy chain. So what we wanna do here is we wanna walk past these copy instructions. We'll also have to be careful to not walk over copy instructions that would make this optimization undesirable or incorrect. Like say a copy is used by another instruction somewhere. In that case, we'd have to keep the result of the CSYNC around, and so we can't really do any meaningful folding anyway. So to do this, we're gonna add another little helper function. What we're gonna do is we're gonna return an optional machine instr. When we find an appropriate def, we'll return the machine instr. Otherwise, we'll return none. The first thing we're gonna do is make sure that the operand that we pass in is a virtual register. We can't walk def use chains in mirror without a virtual register, and so if we don't have one, we're just gonna return none. The next thing we're gonna do is get the machine register info for the machine function. This is necessary for finding the def of the VREG. Next, we're gonna set up the loop for our walk. While we have a copy, we're gonna continue walking, and once we don't have a copy, we'll just return the def. If we have a copy, we wanna get its source. In a copy, this is always the first operand of the machine instr. If we have a physical register, then we can't walk back any further, and so we should just return none. The next thing we wanna check is whether or not the copy is something that we can and should walk over. We wanna prohibit walking over copies with more than one use and more than one def. So if either of these things are true, we're just gonna return none. If we make it past all these checks, then we can get the def of the copy using get vreg def. This process continues until we fail one of the checks or we end up with a non-copy instruction. At the end, if we have a non-copy, we return it. All right, so at this point, we have an instruction but we don't know if it's a CSYNC. Let's check that. What we want is a very specific kind of CSYNC. In particular, we want a CSYNC whose source registers are both the zero register. So what we're gonna do is make another little helper function, which will return true when we have something that we, we might want to optimize. So let's set up our function. The first thing we wanna do is check that the instruction has one of the two opcodes that we care about. If it doesn't, then we're just gonna return false. 
the next thing we're going to do is we're just going to check that the two source operands are both the zero register. If they're not, then we're going to return false. Uh, we're also going to check the flags register. We want to make sure that the flags register isn't dead at the point of this instruction. If the flags register is dead at this point of, at, at this instruction, it couldn't have actually been used by our test branch, and so we can't really fold anything. Finally, if we get past all of that, we're just going to return true. Okay, cool. So now we know that we have a valid pair of instructions. Are we done? Well, that big blank space says, no, we're not done. <laughs> Although we know that we have a valid uh, test branch and CSync, what we don't know is whether or not there's some instruction between the two of them that overwrites the flags register. If this happens, then folding the CSync into the TBNZ is going to be wrong. We'd end up using the flags register as produced by the CSync rather than the instruction in the middle. So we need to make sure that we check for that too. We can check for writes to the flags register like so. This function returns true when the flags register is written to between the two given machine instructions. I'm not going to explain this function because it's already an existing helper function in AR64 instrument info. It's not a particularly complicated function. It's just we have a lot to cover. So you can look at it in your own time as homework. Okay, so at this point we have everything we need to do, or we need to do our transformation. So what we want to do is replace the csync and tbnz with a branch instruction. So the first thing we need to do is build the branch instruction that we want. To do this, we need a couple things. Firstly, we need the machine basic block containing the machine instr. And secondly, we're going to grab the condition code off the csync. Next, we're going to use buildmi to construct and insert the new instruction. This might be kind of controversial to some people in the crowd. BuildMI is one of the two interfaces used in LLVM for constructing new machine instructions. It's used throughout AR64 Instra Info, and that's why I used it here. In other files, you might see Machine IR Builder. There are a couple of things that are going on here. The most important one is to notice how we get at the target opcode. It's, it's done using the get accept, uh, accessor on target Instra Info itself. Next, we're going to add an immediate operand to the machine instr. This will have the condition code that we want. We want to invert the condition code from the csync, and so we're going to use this get inverted cond code helper to get that. All right, now the instruction has the condition code attached to it, so now we have to tell it where it's going to go by grabbing the target off the TBNZ. I know that this is on the second operand of the TBNZ, so I can just copy it over. So now we've inserted the branch instruction into the block. There's one problem, though. We still have the csync and the tbnz instructions. So what we're going to do is erase the tbnz. Cool. So what about the csync? Well, here's the surprise. We'll actually just return true. Earlier, that we checked that the csync has exactly one user, and that user was the tbnz. Since the branch doesn't actually use the csync, the csync now has no users. And so eventually LVM will just automatically delete it. So we're actually done at that point. So now we have a basic people which will allow us to actually perform the transformation that we want. Awesome. So now that we have it, we might want a way to test that it actually works. CodeGen passes are tested using LLC. To get some mirror output from LLC, we can use stop before and stop after. You can use stop before to produce output directly before a pass runs. When you do this, you're going to get some output that contains the original IR for the entire module, possibly with some added metadata used by the compiler. And you're going to get some metadata and actual mirror for each machine function that's in the module as well. Let's say that we used it on this mirror. The first thing we're going to see is the original IR and the added metadata. And the next thing you're going to see is some machine function metadata. This contains information like which registers are used in the function and the function's alignment. Finally, you'll see the mirror as it appears at the end of that pass running. Notice that the mirror output has references to the original IR. The function itself is referenced in the machine function metadata, and basic blocks and other IR constructs, such as called functions, 
are referenced in the mirror output. Strictly speaking, mirror isn't required to have IR attached to it, and it can include things like implicit basic blocks, which aren't included in the original IR. However, if your mirror does have IR in it, you're gonna have to be careful to make sure that the IR and mirror have the same constructs. So now that we have some mirror, we can actually run our pass on it. This is done using run pass. If my pass is the peephole pass that we wrote, and we run it on this mirror, in the new mirror output, we'll see that the branch uh, that we want to replace is successfully replaced as we expected. So by doing this, we have a nice and easy way to check that our passes do what we expect. There are lots of things you can do with the code generator, and so I recommend checking out the documentation to learn more. So we learned a bunch of things today. We learned about LVM IR and its building blocks, such as functions, basic blocks, and instructions. We learned about middle end passes and how they interact with LVM IR. And we learned about how you can use target transform info to tune a middle end pass for a specific target. Finally, we learned about cogen passes in Mirror. We also went over where you can find the documentation for LLVM's APIs and the IR language. So now you should be able to just go ahead and understand LLVM, Mirror, and IR. And you should be able to understand some of the existing code in the middle end and the back end. You should also be able to start working on passes in LLVM, whether or not they are new or existing. Thank you for your time, and I, heard, I hope you learned a lot today. Yeah, we have time for some questions. Hi, thanks, uh, great talk. Uh, quick question about the mirror optimization specifically. Um, I'm familiar with how to add passes for LLVM IR, the generic versions, but for mirror, how does one add transformation passes that can be run um, during the different compilation phases? Um, I think that they go in target pass config, right? They're just, it's, like the thing is, is they're all just listed out in target pass config and then you. Uh, I see, so there's no plugin mod, there, there, there's no plugin model available? I don't think there is, is there? Um, I don't know. I, I don't, don't think, think there so. Is. Okay, so we'll have to uh, have a custom version of LLVM essentially. Yeah, sadly. I see. Yeah. Any more questions? All right, thank you. Thank you.